So our last speaker today is Dr. Grant, Greg Rentfro. He's going to be introducing you to meat processing and options for producers. He works with extension specialists and county agents to establish strong livestock and meat industry programs throughout the state. He does this through outreach and workshops with meat producers and manufacturers and is currently developing a meat marketing program. In addition to his extension work, Dr. Rentfro also manages the Meat Science Lab and Butcher Shop at UK. Let's give him a round. Thank you. Thank you. All right. How, how do I... Oh, there it is. There it is. How's everybody doing this afternoon? I, I, good? All right. Yeah? It, it is definitely a day that tests your hair, hair gel, doesn't it? So, but uh, it's good to be here this afternoon. It's always a, this is always a beautiful location to have this, uh, this uh, uh, event as well. And I have to kind of apologize. My ears are still ringing a bit. Um, I'm a big fan of hard rock and heavy metal music. And I was at a concert last night in Ashland. And it, they're still ringing a little bit. They're not as bad as the concert I went to about a month and a half ago. There you go. They got the devil horns up back there. He's rocking on there. But, <laughs> but I went last night to see Blackstone Cherry, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with those guys, it is a definite uh, Kentucky twist on Southern rock. So, but uh, went to a, a concert about a month and a half ago, and my ears rang for three days after that. It's, it was great. So let's talk about meat processing as we, uh, we get our slides up here. We have a lot of meat processors in the state. Uh, we got about 80 to 85 uh, meat processors that we know of. And I, you say, what do you mean know of? Because every once in a while I drive down the road and I see a, uh, just a sign that says meat processing and they're not kind of registered with us or with uh, KDA or USDA as well. And this is a, a graph I put together, a map I put together, the uh, Commonwealth that kind of looks at the, uh, where the location of all the meat processors are, broke it down into the ones that are USDA inspected, those that are custom, those are in the red, uh, in the red dots, and then you get into the poultry processors, which we need more poultry processors in here. I will say that we have uh, over in Moorhead, uh, you get up there in Round County, we have a one that's getting ready to come online here pretty quick uh, as a poultry processor. And then you see the black dots are the those that are USDA, which means they're USDA inspected, but they either don't slaughter outside animals or they don't slaughter animals at, out, at all. And you're saying, what do you mean? How can you be a meat processor and not slaughter animals? Well, uh, jerky providers, uh, uh, those that do processed meats and so on, uh, they're on that list as well. They're USDA. And then, you know, being a country ham guy, um, I threw in the, the brown dots of the country ham folks. And you can see we got some green dots up there. We got some proposed new ones going in. Uh, the challenge with some of these new ones going in is, is exactly what some of you have been talking about is getting building materials. Uh, I, I can tell you right now, I live in, in Richmond. And in Richmond, we were told in 2020, you guys are going to get a Menards right across the street from Kroger's. That like, cool. And now there's this big mound of dirt that the uh, locals uh, refer to as Mount Menards because they didn't have the building supplies because of COVID. And I thought that was odd. I thought, don't you guys sell the building supplies? Because the Buckies went down the road, went up pretty quick. So let's jump in here and... Uh, Kind of ask yourself. Now, I will say one thing. This is called the homesteader type thing. And I first got introduced to this. I do a lot of work with the University of Maine. I go up there a couple times a year up to UMaine. And the really neat thing about working up there is they, it's a different atmosphere up there. They got a different language, a different uh, kind of culture. They, they eat different than we do as well. A lot of seafood up there. But uh, they're starting to see not only the homesteaders, starting to see an influx of the off-the-grid people as well. And so the, the challenge with being off-the-grid in Maine is being off-the-grid in Maine. All right? If I was going to pick some place where I was going to be off-the-grid, it wouldn't be Maine. I could tell you that right now. But when you start getting into selling products, and this is one thing we talk about up there at UMaine, is you got to ask yourself, why do you want to do this? Okay? Because it's going to be a lot of work, and you need to do your homework on this kind of stuff. And so, and I always encourage people to sit down and say, okay, what's your goals? 
Are you just wanting some extra farm income? You want to promote your farm? Do you want to be the next Laura's, uh, Laura Freeman and Laura's Lean if you want to do that? Probably need to start thinking about insurance. And you say, what do you mean thinking about insurance when I'm selling meat? One time I had a conversation with a law professor when I was in grad school at Mizzou. And I asked him, when do, does a meat processor, whether that be a, an actual meat processor that has a retail store or even a grocery store, so when do you legally cease being responsible for that piece of meat that you sold somebody? And he said, never. Okay. So if you sell a piece of meat to somebody, they drive around in the middle of July with it on the dash of their truck for the next six hours, pull over and they eat it raw. It's still your fault. You got to realize, folks, this is America. I am not responsible for my own actions, okay? So you're going to have to think about insurance. And I want you to think about your target audience as well. And you think that's kind of, kind of odd. Isn't that something like, you know, Anheuser-Busch does and McDonald's and Pepsi? No, I want you to think about that too. Because even the NCBA, National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the National Pork Board, they have a target audience. And I can tell you right now, the NCBA... Their target audience is changing. Their target audience here in the next couple of weeks is going to be men because men grill. And that's where we're heading into grilling season. So they're, they're going to change their target audience on that. But in order to sell, okay, if you want to sell meat off of your farm, we got to talk about some legal stuff first, okay? And you've heard the phrase USDA thrown down a lot today. I've been here the last couple, three hours, and I've heard that quite a bit as USDA. Well, that's because the United States Department of Agriculture governs a lot of things. And what the USDA does not govern, the FDA governs as well. And so we got to think back and take a little bit of a history lesson and go back into 1906. Actually, we got to go back a little bit further, about 1902, 1903, when a, a book called The Jungle came out. It was written by the, a gentleman by the name of Upton Sinclair. And Upton Sinclair wrote the book The Jungle, and there's a big story behind it because the whole purpose of The Jungle was not, was not, I repeat, was not designed to cause meat inspection. Okay? It was really designed to encourage people to, to, uh, to be, for us to become a socialist country. But there was about a dozen or so pages in there that talked about what, in, what went in, into your food, and people got worried about that. And it was enough that it caused Congress to send a commission to Chicago. That's where all the hub of the meats industry was, the Chicago livestock and meats industry. And they came back and said, that commission came back and said, there's enough going on, we probably ought to do something. And in 1906, they passed the Pure Food and Drug Act. And part of the Pure Food and Drug Act was the Federal Meat Inspection Act of 1906. We still operate under that original document today. We've changed it, added to it, obviously, but we operate under that today. And so basically, in government uh, ease, it mandates that all animals have to be, or all meat has to be inspected prior to sale, okay? There's no exceptions. If you call me up and you say, but I'm only doing like a two or three animals a year, I don't have to be inspected, do I? Yes. If you're going to sell, you have to be inspected, okay? And to be honest with you, you really want your product inspected. Because if you can imagine, all right, like we talked about earlier, if somebody gets sick from your product, and they go to sue you, what do you think their lawyer is going to ask right off the bat? Was that product inspected? And you say, well, no. Yeah, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So you really want those, those products to be inspected as well. And so here, you know, if you look nationally, we actually have two types of inspection, federal inspection and state inspection. If you're a federally inspected facility, you can sell in all 50 states. So the Meats Lab at UK, we are a federally inspected facility. Some states have a state inspection service. So you notice all those blue states up there with stars on there? Those are all states that have a state inspection service. Do you notice something unique? Had this conversation yesterday with class, okay? Kentucky's not in that blue. 
Okay, we don't have a state inspection service. So if you think back to that map I showed you, showed you all those that said USDA. I didn't say anything about state because we don't have a state inspection service. So you need to make sure you're working with a USDA inspector. And you say, okay, why do you put that up there? All right. The reason why I put that map up there is some of you may be close to the, one of the borders and you may be working with a meat processor across the border. Classic example, if you're close to Ohio, you may be working with an Ohio inspected meat processor. All right. And if you go over there and you say, I'm going to get in this farmer's market selling my product at a farmer's market and it's an Ohio inspected facility and you bring it back to sell it, that's illegal. Okay, it has to be sold in Ohio. Now, as a consumer, can I cross the border and buy it and bring it back and consume it? Absolutely, as long as the sale of that product happened in Ohio. So if you're close to those border states, you need to kind of pay attention to that stuff as, we, as you go forward on this. All right, now, here's a challenge we've had before, all right? You need to be very cognizant and make sure that you're communicating with your meat processor because some of them will only have the kill floor inspected. Once those carcasses move into the cutting room and a knife hits them, they lose their inspection. Okay, so you need to make sure that all areas of the facility are inspected. Okay, don't... Don't be one of those that finds out by accident that, you know, hey, it was inspected, but once it got cut up, it lost its inspection. And you'll see where I, I've got underneath there, I've got a cutting room. I've got raw, not ground. I've got ground, raw ground. And then you see some of the processed meat ones. Those little phrases underneath there, those things are called titles for HACCP plans. Those are HACCP plans. And the reason why I throw those up there for you is in case you're talking with a meat processor. This is how I start to introduce you to how to talk with a meat processor. And you may say, I think I want you guys to make some of the, uh, this ground product into summer sausage. And he may come back and tell you, well, I don't have a fully cooked shelf stable or a fully cooked not shelf stable HACCP plan. That's what he's talking about, meaning he can't do it legally because he doesn't have the HACCP plans. All right. And you say, what is a HACCP plan? HACCP plan is another one of those food safety uh, pro uh, products that we have in there to where all of our meat goes through a HACCP plan. So classic example, if you had a, a piece of bacon today for breakfast that you bought at a grocery store, that went through a slaughter HACCP plan. It went through that raw, not ground HACCP plan. And then it went through that heat treated, not shelf stable HACCP plan. So it went through three different HACCP plans before you got it to put in your microwave or skillet or wherever you put that in as well. And then the other thing that uh, that inspector is going to do is not only make sure that, you know, that our products are legal, all right, to sell, but that inspector has lots of jobs that he does. And mainly he's going to do a pre and post-mortem inspection. He wants to see those animals alive. He wants to make sure they're not displaying any outward signs of disease. He does that to make sure a wholesome, healthy animal enters into the food chain, all right? He's also going to be uh, uh, paying attention to those meat processors to make sure they're handling those animals humanely. Not only is it the right thing to do because we are supposed to be uh, good handlers of animals and, and good providers for animals, but it's also a reason they do it because it causes meat quality issues if they're overly stressed. So he checks that out. He also makes sure the facility is clean and sanitary. He's going to do a post-mortem inspection on those animals as well because we know that animals are really good at hiding when they're sick or injured. Okay, So he's going to do that stuff as well. So he's got a lot of, of uh, things that he does to make sure that we have a healthy, wholesome product entering into the food chain. So the next step is you got to figure out what production system you want. And so I kind of focused on beef here, but it, it would kind of fits in any one that you want. Do you want to be a grain finished operation? Okay. Do you want to be a forage finished operation? Or do you want to be a hybrid, uh, what we call a grain on grass operation, which a lot of them out there are grain on grass uh, 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 finishers. And then Legal definitions like natural. Natural has a legal definition. There actually is a legal definition for natural. It has nothing to do with the, 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 
the definition that you think of now that you hear a lot out there. Um, and that's the no antibiotics and no growth promotants given to them. Has no, the legal definition has nothing to do with that, okay? Do you want to be organic, okay? Organic has a lot of very, very strict guidelines, okay? And you just can't wake up tomorrow morning and say, we're going organic. It's a three-year process, okay? Um, but I will say this, regardless of what you're doing, you should always be local. And why do I say you should always be local? I've been, been doing this for 17 years at UK, and I can tell you right now, the people are buying your story, okay? They want to know that you're a third-generation farmer. You got five kids, and they're in 4-H and FFA. They want to know that, all right? They want to know that. That's the selling point. To them, the meat is, is just a byproduct. They're buying your story, okay? It doesn't take anything to become Kentucky Proud. I encourage everybody to do that as well. So always tell your story because you want to be local. That's the big thing. And I've kind of broken things down of, uh, from a beef standpoint, but it kind of fits in, you know, pork and lamb and goats as well. And so, you're going to start selling this stuff. And so you need to kind of think about how you're going to do it. And so I, I, I started out with the easiest option and we get into some of the more, more and more challenging option. Probably the easiest thing to do is to sell freezer beef or freezer pork, where you're going to sell quarters, halves, si or whole carcasses, uh, and so on. That's the easy way to do it. Okay. You sell it to them. Boom. Don't have to worry about anything else. The challenge of it is most people's, what do their freezers look like? It's, the, it's that compartment above the refrigerator, right? So that's, you know, what, not very many feet, cubic feet in there. They can't handle a 300 pounds of meat, can they? And so that's where you get into these beef shares where several people go in and they buy those kinds of things as well. And so it makes things a little bit easier for you, the farmer, to do this as a beef share or a pork share situation. The other thing is the farmer's market or the roadside stands. That's a little bit easier, or I shouldn't say a little bit easier, a little bit more challenging to do than the freezer beef because now we're selling bundles, all right? And you say, what do you mean by a bundle? I always encourage folks to do this, sell meat in bundles because folks are willing to pay a premium for your middle meats, your ribeyes, your strip steaks, your T-bones, your filet mignons, your pork chops, and so on. They may not be willing to pay a premium for ground beef, roasts, and things like that. So what we've encouraged folks to do is sell things in a bundle so you have a $50 bundle where they get a few steaks, a few roasts, and a few pounds of ground beef. And you say, why do we do that? The reason why we want you to do that, or we encourage you to do that, I say, shouldn't we want you to do that? The reason why we encourage you to do that is because you're not stuck with the undesirable cuts that people don't want to pay a premium for. You say, sell it in bundles. You don't have to, you don't have a back stock of inventory, okay? So freezer beef, a little bit easier. A little bit more challenging when we get in the farmer's markets and the roadside stands because that's a lot more labor to do that, all right? And then we get into the really challenging stuff. And you've heard me use that word challenging quite a bit here. And I, our baseball coach, uh, Coach Mangione, one time I heard him talk and he said, I always tell my players, don't come with me of problems, come with me with a challenge because challenges can be overcome. And so that's why you hear me say that. We start getting a little bit more challenging, internet sales, all right? That's a bit of a challenge. Again, we wanna make sure that we have those bundles because that makes it, keeps you from having a, a surplus of products there. But now, if you're doing internet sales, you need to find a 10-year-old kid to set up your, in, your, uh, your web page. all right? I can tell you right now, my daughter's 14 and we have problems with our phone, we just, Brooke, come here and fix it, okay? That's the reason why I say you need a 10-year-old kid. Social media, all right? Social media is a big thing nowadays. I, I don't do social media. I'm thoroughly convinced in the book of Revelations when it says so many of us are going to be saved, it's going to be those of us that are not on Facebook, okay? So, but that is, I understand that even though I don't do it personally, I know other people do it, you know, and so that's one way that, they, and, and, and the kids nowadays, that's how they 
they communicate with each other is via social media. And so if you're going to do internet sales, that's what you've got to do. In fact, I worked with a farmer who's uh, here in Kentucky. His daughter was runner-up for America's Next Top Model. He utilized her to sell beef because she had a lot of connections in New York and, and, and L.A., and so he utilized her to sell that, sell that product. Then we get into restaurants, okay? This is extremely challenging. The reason why it's extremely challenging, because the restaurants only want the good stuff. And you may be able to talk to a restaurant into buying your stuff, and I say restaurants, I'm not talking about knocking on the door Outback Steakhouse, all right? I'm talking about a local independent restaurant. And you may talk them into buying all your ribeyes, and they're gonna buy them, and they're gonna sell them, they're gonna come back to you next week and say, I need, 15 more ribeyes. You're going to say, I've got them, but the cattle are still using them right now. Okay? So it's really a challenge to supply them. All right? You may be able to do a special kind of weekend deal with them. Uh, Chef Weta Michael is very good about doing that. She understands that sometimes I can't get a farm to give me everything I want at and need at once, but I can work with them on a weekend kind of highlight special type thing as well. And so it's going to be really challenging to, to work with restaurants, all right? Uh, we had a situation one time where, where some farmers were upset because we had a steak and shake on campus, and they said, well, why can't we sell local beef to steak and shake? Because steak and shake has their own providers, okay? So that's, where you, that's why I say you have to work with the independent local ones. And then everybody says, I want to get into a grocery store. Good luck. All right. Uh, they require not only USDA inspection, which we need to be legal. They're also going to get into other food safety programs like GFSI, Global Food Safety Initiative. Okay. That require more and more. We start talking about slotting fees. We start talking about massive, massive amounts of animals that you need. And you say, well, the Cattlemen's Association did it. Yeah, they took Cattlemen's Association about two or three years to set it up just so they could get into Kroger. And Kroger wanted them in there. Okay? That's the big difference. Kroger wanted Kentucky Proud Beef in there. All right? And they work through the Cattlemen's Association to do it, but it's not an easy thing to do, folks. It's not easy. And they're just doing one product, okay? They're just doing ground beef, ground beef patties. So grocery stores can be a challenge, all right? Now, if I haven't thoroughly scared you to death yet, you got to work with meat processors. And I don't want you to be intimidated, all right? Because meat processors, they kind of remind me of my IT guy back at UK, because my IT guy back at UK, when I have a problem, I say, Kevin, it's, it, it's, something's wrong. And he looks at it and he does this, that, and the other for about five minutes and he tells me what's wrong with it. And he's speaking English, but I have no idea what he's saying. What in the world is a SCSI drive? Okay, you know, the stuff like that. And so that's the same thing with meat processors. They, we have a language that we speak in. All right, and if you don't understand, ask, okay? And the first question you need to ask is, are you a USDA inspected, all right? And I understand that location is extremely important, all right? But you still need to make sure you have one that's USDA inspected, all right? And I would encourage you also to sit down with that meat processor for a meeting and let them know what you're going to do and what your plans are because now they are your partner through this whole thing. And they need to understand what you've got going on and what you want to do as well because, you know, their inspection legend has to go on all that stuff. And I want you to be very transparent, all right? We've heard it all. We've heard it all. I've heard every single idea when it comes to meat and livestock that's going to revolutionize the world and make everybody multi-billionaires. All right? I've heard it all. I say that and then somebody will come up with something. All right? My favorite was the guy that was going to start buying the distiller's grain from the distillery and tell people, I forget what distillery it was, but it, I'm just going to pick on Buffalo Trace because they're just down the road here. He's going to say, these are Buffalo Trace fed cattle. And he said, you know there'd be people can taste it in there. And he's right. There probably is people who say, I can taste the Blantons in there. 
But, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of it, and those guys have as well. So be transparent when you talk with them. Ask yourself, can you work with this person, all right? Is this a company you can work with? Do you feel comfortable going to them with problems? Because I guarantee you're going to have problems, all right? And if you're going to be sending customers that's buying your product to there, you want to make sure the facility looks nice as well. What does the parking lot look like? Is it a dirt lot? That's not a very attractive place to send your customers, all right? Um, what does the inside look like? Okay, meat processing facilities have a smell, okay? And that's just what they do. But you need to ask yourself, is that a normal smell? And it was funny, it was one time I had somebody call me up and said, I, I followed your advice, I went in there, it had a smell, it smelled like bleach, and I left. And I said, if it smells like bleach, that's good. And they're like, why is that good? Because that means it's clean, okay? That means it's clean, all right? Do the staff appear to be friendly and so on and so forth? The retail cuts, if they have a retail meat case, so if, for example, I'm going to pick on Boone's down in Bardstown, they have retail meat cases. That's the, the cuts that you're going to get. They do an excellent job down there. The guys up at Trackside do an excellent job as well, okay? So you need to make sure that you look at those facilities and study those facilities, all right? And just like in any relationship, there's always going to be challenges, all right, no matter what you do. And we've had processors and meat and uh, farmers get in, into it before, and it just costs everybody money, and you don't want to start throwing money away. So you want to make sure that you understand the concept of communication, all right? The last thing as a direct marketer you want to do is switch meat processors. Why? Because you have to start all over again, all right? And like I said, every relationship has a challenge to make sure we're not throwing money away, all right? So things to talk with your customers, all right? Most of our consuming public has been grown up on, on grocery store beef and grocery store pork. It's a different, different avenue, all right? Uh, if you're selling freezer beef, beef you need to say okay are we starting with the live animal are you are they buying the live animal are they buying the carcass you know we had this discussion in class yesterday all right we had some uh, animals that were processed for them and i said okay this is this is a 775 pound carcass if you buy this are you going to take home 775 pounds of meat no you're probably only going to take about 300 pounds home okay so if, Consumers need to understand that kind of stuff. You need to make sure that they understand that they're not taking all that home. You need to understand that in local processors dry age versus wet age. Grocery stores get things in that are wet age. Local processors dry age things. That's going to have a different flavor as well. If you have a customer base that likes the forage finished or the grass finished animals, that's going to have a totally different flavor than grain finished as well so you need to communicate that with your customers as well on that kind of stuff and that whole concept of the freezer all right that's why i had the picture of the deep freezes up there is some people say well how much can how much do i space do i need and we usually say about 30 to 40 pounds per cubic foot all right then probably the next conversation you're going to have is what is a cubic foot okay but uh, that's where folks need to understand that kind of, uh, kind of lingo that you need to, to work with them as well. And so we need to make sure that we're doing our homework, all right, and that we're getting into this, that we're not jumping into things without knowing what we're getting into. Uh, this can be a lot of work. It really can be. be. Have realistic goals, okay? It took Laura Freeman a long time before she became a household name, all right? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And since I'm the, what's standing between you and everybody else's uh, freedom, as they say, in, in, on a Saturday afternoon, somebody asked me one time, what is the cool thing about being a professor? And I said, uh, sometimes you have uh, students that know rock stars. And uh, so, I'm a big, like I said, I'm a big fan of rock music. And so I've gotten to know a couple of rock stars over the years that, through my students. In fact, uh, uh, the gentleman up here with the spiky hair, uh, that's Jacoby Shattuck, the lead singer for Papa Roach. His niece was in my class, TA'd for me as well. So it's always kind of cool about that. And with that, I will entertain any questions, entertain being the operative word there.
and a hush fell over the crowd. This is like teaching all over again. I asked my students to say, hey, you got any questions? And they look at, what's that? Yeah, they're all, I'm just standing between people and Bourbon 30 is what it is. So, um, yeah. Okay, first of all, your meme game in your slide is amazing, and I really <laughs> appreciate it. It's been great. Um, so what about, like, uh, how easy or difficult is it to get into, like, local food co-ops, uh, like, good foods or locals here in town? How easy it is, is it to get involved with one of those? Those, I've worked with uh, the local food co-ops in the past. It's been a long, long time ago. Uh, essentially, you know, the, the, the same rules apply, the USDA and all that other fun stuff, but I would encourage you to schedule a meeting time with them so that you could uh, see what their requirements are. Uh, because like I said, with grocery stores and a lot of restaurants, especially the chain restaurants, they require extra food safety programs to put in place. And, you know, you don't want to, Tell them, that, oh, yeah, we're inspected, and, you know, they say things like, well, we, have you got all the food safety plans in place? And you're like, oh, yeah, we got that to find out that you don't, you know. So it's a good, good to schedule a meeting with them. So, yep. All right, we got I sell pork already. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the question is basically it's a challenge to sell a half or a whole pig. And I would ask you the question, uh, what is, what is, what's your consumers telling? What's your customers te uh, telling you the why they don't want to buy a whole one or a half one? Well, I think for one, the price scares them. Yeah. For another, I think it's all the different products and the storage capacity. And how do I cook all the <laughs> How do I cook all those? Yeah. Yeah, that's I, I, I figured there was two things that popped in my head when you said that was the storage capacity, the freezer space and the cooking of it. Most everybody are comfortable cooking pork chops and bacon, you know, but then you get in the big roast and it's a different story there. Um, for that, what I would do is reach out to the Kentucky pork producers. They have absolutely free of charge recipe cards that you can give to your, your customer base. And it's the same thing with anybody that does beef. You can reach out to the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association. They got those recipe cards as well that you give them as well. Um, yes, the price is, 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 is a challenge, you know. It's, it's a sticker shock, you know. But, you know, uh, you could also sit down and say, okay, this is how we cut it up, and this is how many meals you're going to get out of this side of pig or side of beef or lamb or whatnot and if you're able to say okay yes it's going to cost you a couple hundred dollars but you're going to get 25 30 meals out of it that may make it a little bit easier yeah <clears throat> yep selling in bundles yeah yeah, <laughs> it's a chat i can tell my i'm sorry folks my i i've i lectured nine hours a day for the last two days and then i went to a concert last night and so my voice is going quickly <laughs> so, we had another question over here um lots of people use farm shares as a way to get out of selling raw milk could you sell legally home processed say chickens or rabbits to nope. people with farm shares nope 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 i wouldn't even i folks i'm gonna tell you right now the do not sell raw milk all right do not that is dangerous stuff there's a reason why we pasteurize it from a food safety standpoint all right so i would not do that that's i have i can remember it's about five years ago county agent called me up and said you're the only one i know that knows something about food safety kids got e coli really bad from raw milk to the point where two of them were in the hospital because of it. So not a fan of that, not a fan of that. Well, follow-up question to that. Yep. You might, might have spoke about this in your presentation and I might have missed it, but um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between a custom cut facility and a USDA yeah. inspected facility? Yeah, a custom facility and a USDA facility. So the difference between those is um, basically a USDA facility is, now let me back up a little bit. Those, those dots that I had up there that were red that were USDA, they're not 
processing USDA 100% of the time. Uh, classic example, Central Kentucky Meats, 30% of the time he's processing USDA, the rest he's doing custom. The best way I can describe custom is you, the farmer, take your animal to that meat processor, he processes it, cuts it up for you. He's going to stamp every package not for sale, and that is intended for you and your family's consumption. If you sell it, you have broken the law. Okay? USDA, you know, is basically if you plan on selling it at a farmer's market, roadside stand, and whatnot. So that's the big difference between those two. So then what is your take on pre-selling a share of that animal before it gets slaughtered if custom pre-selling the share of an animal that means they're like a racehorse you own the live animal then it's the same thing as you the farmer okay that's how some people get around that but again make sure the custom facility that you're using is is good because i've heard some horror stories of a couple of custom facilities in this state that i I don't know if I will let my wife's dog eat from there, to be honest with you. I'm really not a big fan of my wife's dog. So, <laughs> yep. If they own the live animal. If they, and the and, and reason why I say that is you could be nice enough to take it to the to track side for them, but if they own the live animal, they have to own the live animal. Because essentially then they're you. Yeah, they're you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Nope, you're, gonna get, you're getting attacked here. You're getting, you're yeah. getting assaulted from behind here. Uh-oh. <laughs> I was thinking some, like to know if you could give me any information on the, uh, the process from UK on uh, enhancing uh, slaughter techniques. I know that they, a couple of years ago, they was given classes every oh, so often. Oh, still do. Done it for 17 years. I bet I've, in the 35 plus years I've cut meat, I think I've probably trained three or 4,000 people. So we still do that, yeah. Well, yeah. how do we go about getting information to get up on a class? Uh, we have the two beef classes sold out. I still got some uh, space available for the pork class. So, so yeah. So yeah, just shoot me an email. And uh, the thing is, I really don't advertise those because I've got such a waiting list, you know, that I, it, you know, but I do have room available for the pork class. So, so what is, what's, the, what's the fee for the pork class, for example? $500. $500 compared yeah. to over $1,000 for the Wendell Berry program in Henry County, just as a reference. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, right now, we're looking for a new uh, processor because Marksbury took down their ability to process pigs over 400 pounds, I think. Yeah. Um, and our coals normally are over that or just about, you Your know. Your coal sows, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know of any um, processors that possibly do that around the Madison County area? Uh, around the Madison County area... I, I, and I'm staring up for the, uh, they, they say when you're staring up, you're thinking. Uh, the closest one I would think that I would put you down the road would be Central Kentucky Meats, which is, is Casey County. Uh, uh, we, we don't have a meat processor in, um, in Madison County. There's one, and I say this, I don't know if they're still open or not. There was one over by Irvin. Uh, but they were selling and going to try to reopen, but I haven't heard from those folks. So, yeah. I thought I heard a question over here. Yes. Yep. 500. Yep. 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 And I, I felt guilty about that. Then I seen Iowa State for a sausage making class charges 1500 <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes, sir. Yep. 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 
the as far as that goes okay you help me out I'm, I'm not quite following your train of thought Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm following you. And, and Steve walked in the back room as well. He's probably more versed on the poultry than I am. You know, safe, food safety is always the key. Humane handling of the animals always keep making sure they're let out as well. And help me out, Steve. You got to have a HACCP. Your, what's your HACCP plan say they have to be chilled to before you can cut them up? You say that before it down 40 degrees before you cut them up. That's what his HACCP plan. And when we say HACCP plan, you say, you know, okay, then I can create my own number. No, that has to be backed up by science. So when he says 40 degrees, he has a research paper, several research papers that say 40 degrees, safe, cut them up type stuff. Oh, the water chill, the air chill, it, it, yeah, obviously uh, the, the water chill, the ice bath would be a little bit quicker to chill those down uh, than the air, but both have the same standard for both. They have to reach a certain temperature before we cut them up. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's the, that's the issue we run into sometimes is people are more familiar with what they see at the grocery store, and if it doesn't look like what they see at the grocery store, they, they shy away from it. So, other questions before? And if not, I'll hang around a little bit. If some folks are afraid to talk in front of people, I'm kind of that way. I, I get nervous talking in front of people, right? <laughs> so, thank you guys for having me out here this, uh, this afternoon, and be careful going home because I've been where I'm sitting, I can see... The power lines are doing this number and the trees are doing this number, so it's windy out there, so, so be safe as you go home.